Um, I'd like to probably start with with um, a small note about myself. I am a software engineer uh, for approximately 10 years by now. And um, um, all over the years, I learned that, you know, there is so many things that you don't know that the most important thing in my mind, right, is to keep focusing on um, on the algorithms and the principles, not on the tools, right? So that's what I want to touch on today, um, specifically the transactional messaging patterns. Um, and um, I'd like to start with um, um, a small exercise, right? So if you take a, uh, if you take a look around you, right, um, you'll notice quite a lot of devices, right? Your laptop, your phone, your watch, maybe, maybe your TV, um, you can think of your car and other lots of things in your home and in your office are a part of a several different distributed systems, right? And um, <clears throat> every day in one way or the other, you communicate to dozens, if not hundreds of them, even not thinking about it, right? And um, um, I hope that by now, most of us, if not all of us, um, have a pretty good understanding of how they are built, right? And um, I'd like to make the session a bit more, you know, um, as, a, um, as a as a discussion and conversation. So I am hoping that you guys will help me out with this. Um, so I'm looking for a volunteer, like anyone. Um, can you describe in a sentence or two um, what kind of systems you are working on right now? Is it, um, say, I don't know, a monolithic application with some front end uh, that is executed on the browser? Or is it um, service-oriented architecture? Or is it, is it something else? Um, anyone? The only thing you have to do is to unmute. None. All right. Well, uh, so, I, I, so yeah. I can yeah. go ahead. Uh, so I have an experience uh, in uh, working with Monolith application and uh, microservice applications. All right, perfect. Those two are exactly the uh, you know the the they fall under this distributed system term that I have used earlier, right? And they are a good examples that um, we can talk through during this session as well. But if you are working on anything else um, similar to that, as long as it is deployed on more than one physical uh, hardware, right? That's also a distributed system, right? So keep that in mind as we talk about this. And uh, um, I hope that, you know, projecting this, this conversation onto your projects will be helpful as well, okay? All right, so okay. moving on. Um, there is a, you know, these bars, buzzwords that we've heard um, all over the, the our career paths, right? Which is loosely, loosely coupled. And we talk about this as, you know, in .NET world, you, you would talk about this on the level of classes, on the level of assemblies, right? On the level of uh, um, services or applications in, in, you know, all over the place. But have you ever wondered what, like, can you give a good, um, explanation of what do they mean? Anyone? A good example is, is also fine. Is so that... I think... Let's start with Andre if you don't mind, all right? Uh, yeah, uh, so for, uh, I think uh, the mm, good example will be that uh, changing uh, one uh, system will not uh, uh, bring uh, or uh, will not require changes on another system. Uh, so for loosely coupled systems or lo loosely coupled components uh, doesn't uh, depends on each other. So they depends on the interfaces uh, which they are providing. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good one. But uh, to be honest, not really complete one. Bogdan, do you have anything to add to it? Maybe I can. Yeah, but uh, let's, sorry, let's start from Bogdan. I think he was the second one. Okay. No, 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 it's okay. I just wanted to a bit extend the previous answer, which was meaningful, like the meaning about interfaces. It's just a contract. 
your components communicating over some contract. And as, fall, uh, as far as this contract followed, uh, you can replace these components to whatever you want, and this is it. And uh, also, like all the things that happen, happen inside these components independently, and you don't know what's going on really under hood, except the contract. This is it. OK, that's a good one, too. But it also is not complete. So he? Uh, so in my example, uh, I think that uh, it's a distributed system. Uh, for example, uh, trade system. Uh, then we have a lot of uh, um, a, a, a lot of uh, blocks, uh, logic blocks, uh, which communicate through, for example, RabbitMQ, uh, through different contracts, uh, interfaces. Uh, and uh, these uh, cells of uh, logic process uh, uh, communicate uh, only through uh, this broker. Uh, and uh, no one knows uh, what happened uh, in, uh, in, different, in different blocks. Thanks. That's a great example. Um, I'll try to, you know, to generalize because like all the three answers I've heard, they're great. Right, they really, um, you know, they, they point out important things here, but I want to make the definition as abstract as I can, right? So when we're saying interfaces and contracts, that's a key part here. Like, if you want, like, we, we want to achieve an abstraction, right? And we want to make sure that there is, um, but th there is still a way to communicate between what, whatever the components are. Is it classes that, uh, you know, rely on interfaces? Or are we talking about, um, you know, assemblies that rely on public um, public members of the assemblies um, uh, of the other assemblies? Or is it um, uh, is it say to services that rely on some API contract? Or is it even a you know a message driven or event driven system where you rely on the contract of the messages that you are um, that you are publishing or con or consuming somewhere, right? Um, that's always is critical. These things are critical parts in this loose coupling. But let me ask you this. We said that, uh, I think Andre mentioned that at the beginning that a change to one um, component, uh, which is loosely coupled to the other, should not require a change to the other. But the reality is it's not always possible. Like you, you inevitably have breaking changes at some point, right? That's, that's what happens even with the tools that we are using. Um, say with Docker or um, say with .NET Framework implementation or others, like you inevitably have some kind of a breaking change that um, everything else that you thought is loosely coupled now has to adopt to, right? That's one thing which we should consider when we're talking loosely coup loose coupling, but also if we are talking about a distributed system that operates, um, let's say, it might be a service-oriented architecture, or it might be microservices, or even it could be like two monoliths that are integrated somehow through an API. Let me ask you this. If you make a call to one of these services, and suppose that service has to, like in order to you know, return you a response, it's, it, is, it has to talk to the service B, right? Um, and maybe that one has to make a call to a database, for example. If they all, they all rely on a contract, right? There is some kind of a contract. Is, is it a REST API or is it gRPC or whatever it is? It is a contract. So we kind of said that they are loosely coupled. But is it really the case? Like what happens if for some reason um, your service somewhere downstream is not available? Like what if what if it's down of or what if it's overloaded and it's timing out or what if you have a problem with the network, right? Are you still loosely coupled? Because really, what will happen most likely um, is that you will fail to actually provide a response. And in worst cases, if your you know if your service is built in the worst possible way, you can even crash, right? So, is this the loose coupling that we are trying to achieve? Any thoughts on that? It's a bit depend on your implementation. If you're using some service bus, you can postpone response because it's not going to be immediate. And uh, you can like process something that was not able to process right now. It will be processed later, if it's possible, of course, if you're not canceling it or like that. Sure, that's a great one. So with that in mind, right, what we're saying is 
in terms of examples, right? Uh, communication between components through an API based on a contract is fine, and we could say it's loose coupling. But at the same time, it's sometimes too tight, right? And the decision on is it too tight or not is mostly dictated by your business requirements, right? On, on your, um, let me rephrase this, on your functional requirements, right? On what exactly the system should be doing. And maybe some of the non-functional, like how it should be doing that. So um, I guess that to generalize the definition, when we are talking about loose coupling, we want to make sure that if you have two components, right, the change to one of them should have minimal impact on the other one. Like we, I think we should embrace the fact that at some point the change will be inevitable. It will, it will, it will cause the effect on, on your um, partners that talk through the API, because sooner or later you will introduce a breaking change or um, you will cause, a, you know, worst case, a cascading effect on your on your um, API consumption consumers or, or um, sorry, API clients, right? But my point is the loose coupling that we discussed about, uh, that we talked about, which is based on the API calls is something that we are used to, but sometimes we can do better than that. Um, so let's figure out um, how do we do this, right? Um, we said, okay, like REST and RPC based APIs are tight coupling to some degree. Right. For some cases, it's okay, but maybe not for all of them. Especially if you have some uh, heavy workloads if, that you have to execute uh, in order to provide a response. Right. That's that's where you would think the first thing you would do is like, okay, I have to make this asynchronous. Right. Or maybe in order to process this request, you would have to, um, you know, cause it tons of different requests to the downstream services. Now, that's that kind of workload. It, it just asks you to, you know, to implement it in a synchronous manner because there are too many possible points of failures, right? There are too many dependencies. And um, as you are introducing dependency on the other service, for example, even if it's API based, it's still a, a dependency between two components. And when the amount of dependencies becomes too great, right? Um, too large, then it's probably not the greatest thing to do, right? Because then as a maintainer, as a maintainer of that component, you will have to worry about too many things. Like, are all of my clients okay, right? Are my changes introducing a breaking change? Now, okay, I have to track down all the release notes of all the services I depend on, to, right? Especially if I do not control them. I have to make sure that they do not introduce breaking changes. I have to make sure that if they do, I can adopt properly and I can release properly. I have to make sure that I'm not causing, you know, that I'm not overloading my partners through the API and so on, right? So how do we do this differently? Is event-driven architecture or message-driven architecture an answer, right? Well, maybe. And, um, you know, to, to make that decision, is it an answer or not? I'd say you have to try. You have to work with one to see what kind of pros and cons it brings to the to the picture, right? But what I want to suggest here is to look at one of the approaches on how do you achieve loose coupling and some tools you could use. And um, let's do that on a particular example, right? So here's what we got. Um, let's say a monolith, which is, okay, yuck. Usually when you hear a monolith, especially if you're, you know, looking for a new project to work on, the first thing you do is no, 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 no. Well, I don't think that's a correct way to approach them because they are quite lovely while they're not too big, right? But nevertheless, we can use a monolith as an example, or we can think of a service-oriented architecture where multiple services are sharing the database. Um, well, in fact, for this example, it doesn't matter, right? What I want to show you is more related to um, to relational databases and messages um, that, and, and how you can combine that. So let's say we don't care. Is it service-oriented architecture? Is it a monolith? Is it uh, a microservice with a database? Is it something else? Doesn't matter. Let's just pick a persistent storage for the example. And for this example, let's use SQL Server database. Now, the 
the goal that we will try to pursue is, um, you know, I want to build a new service that is loosely coupled to the rest of the system, right? And, and has access to the data that is in the SQL Server database, right? Um, I don't want to have a direct access to it because that's probably not the best choice, even though it's frequently used for the service-oriented architectures. Um, so I want to build like a new microservice, right? Or, or whatnot, uh, you can call it whatever you would like. But point is, it doesn't have to have an access to this SQL Server database, but it needs the data from there and it can't make a request to an API that has an access to this SQL Server database because that would basically bring the loose coupling that break the loose coupling that we're trying to achieve. So, all right, we talked about the fact that let's let's give it a try and let's use um, let's use some some messaging, right? Let's um, try to use some kind of message bus. Um, well, maybe or maybe better to use an event store. I don't know at this point, right? Uh, but what I do know is that I want something that big boys are using. I want to to you know I want a tool that is proven on the market that um, that uh, say majority of the um, largest companies have already um, employed and they have a proven patterns and built patterns to, on how to use that because that means that the tool is already reliable right and that i can find something that i can use for um uh for you know for, for my own education right that's probably a good choice so how about we use Apache Kafka for the thing, right? Have like, do we have anyone on the call who have ever worked with it? No. Nope. All right. So I'm going to um, to try to give you an intro to it, and I'll try to do this in three slides. Okay. This will be very basic information about Kafka, and. Um, I am hoping that it will be enough for you to, you know, to get started, get interested. And if you want more details, just let me know after the, um, after this presentation, and I can either point you to good resources, or we can talk about the, the, the questions or ideas you have, um, or we can make another, um, another demo. All right. So let's take a look at this picture. What do we have here, right? Um, I hope you can see my cursor. Right? Um, here is the Kafka cluster, that's the boundary of it. We have four components inside of it, which is three brokers and a zookeeper. Let's figure out, let's talk about what they are and how do they work, okay? Brokers is a component, those are components of a, of a Kafka cluster that usually deployed on a dedicated server. And the reason for it is you want to achieve a durability and that means that failovers are important. And if one broker is failed, you should be capable to fail over to a different one, right? That's a more advanced topic, but we can touch, touch that topic a little bit at the end of the, of the demo. So usually you would make a broker per physical server, right? Um, now the brokers are isolated from other brokers, at least for now. Um, I'll explain why in a, mo in a moment. Now, the zookeeper is responsible for orchestrating brokers. And the reason why I said that brokers are isolated from others for now is that zookeeper is marked for deprecation. Um, Kafka's team is going to deprecate it in one of the future versions. Um, and uh, But like for now, we are still using uh, this kind of uh, uh, of, of the of the architecture of the Kafka, right? Um, so how this works is the broker is basically responsible for holding the data that you that someone is producing to Kafka, right? And it's responsible for providing the data to the consumers. We will talk a bit more about what the producers and consumers are. Point is, broker basically has the data. Okay. Now. Why do we have a cluster of brokers? Why do we have multiple of them? Um, the the reason for it is that you want to be capable of load balancing a little bit, right? You also want to achieve a good durability, which means you have to think about failovers and you have to 
make sure about which make sure that you can replicate the data so if for some reason one of the servers where you had a broker is unrecoverable right you're not losing data so that's uh just a few reasons why you have multiple brokers in kafka's cluster you can find more in kafka's official docs but um those are i think those two are already sufficient to explain why you have multiple of them um now the zookeeper um it knows what, what the brokers are it knows what they what they have right and it can trace down the failure of the broker and typically reassign the the basically tell a different broker that hey you are responsible for providing a particular set of data which is again a bit more advanced topic we don't need that for now and you definitely don't need that for you know for quick start on kafka let's talk a little bit more about producers and consumers so producer is a component that um, uses kafka's producer api to publish messages um, it is not a part of kafka cluster the producer api is the producers themselves are not so producers are basically maybe your applications maybe applications of a different team within your organization right or maybe even within a different organization and uh, all they do is they just publish data to kafka um, to specifically to a kafka topic but we'll touch topics in a few moments uh, we'll talk about them so that's the producer so in in you know if you, if you are familiar with the uh, pub set patterns that's the pub side right that's what publishes data um now the consumers um they are marked on this diagram as a consumer group i'll explain why in, in a moment but the consumers are again components that use cons consumer api to subscribe and pull messages from kafka now again they are not part of uh kafka's cluster this is usually whoops sorry this is usually a uh, your application that subscribes to a particular topic and says hey i want to know everything that this topic has for me and uh important thing here is that this is subscribe and pull it's not subscribe and push this is actually a deliberate decision that kafka had made um and in my humble opinion it simplified their job a lot and it also helps um for us as developers too right um reason being usage of this kafka cluster helps you to achieve a loose coupling between producers and consumers right so i don't want to like i don't want to care about uh any consumers when i'm producing data i don't want to care about uh, how producers are faring at the moment when i'm consuming the data and at the same time kafka as a as a as a tool as a as a framework if you will um it also doesn't really have to um, you know, keep track and try pushing the data to all the consumers because you can have multiple of them. So basically Kafka says, hey, I don't really care too much about you. Like I'm still going to, you know, to check if, if a particular consumer is alive once it was subscribed to, to a particular topic, but um, I'm not going to push any data to, to your consumers. I'm going to wait for them to um, ask me for the data, right? And that's actually a quite interesting decision because consider a situation when your consumer is overloaded for some reason, right? If Kafka, if Kafka keeps pushing messages to your consumer, it doesn't help, right? So this, this decision took away the responsibility from Kafka uh, on, you know, being resilient in terms of not overwhelming consumers and it basically allows you to consume in in your own pace which is a very nice um, uh, ability that this kind of architecture provides um, all right consumer groups finally so the consumer group is a set of cooperating consumers they they are sharing the offsets i'll explain them in a moment too and they are balanced as a whole uh, we will talk about this more later, but point is um, Kafka tracks consumers since the moment that they um, have subscribed to a particular topic. Um, and 
it assigns a partition of the data, I'll explain that in a moment too, uh, to a particular consumer. So if one of your consumers is, is down for some reason, it's not responsive, then the partition has to be reassigned to a uh, consumer group, to another consumer within the same consumer group, right? And also if all your consumer group goes down and then goes up again, it can continue consuming from exactly the same place where it left off. So you don't have to reprocess all this stuff again. Let's get a bit deeper into what the topics and partitions are. I've mentioned them a little bit, and then we can get back to this topic again. All right, so here's the second uh, slide and in my take on, you know, explain Kafka in three slides. So that's what topic looks like, right? The topic is basically a set of partitions, right? But that doesn't help a lot. Let's think about topic as a, you know, you can, you can think of it as, as a category of records of the messages that you are sending to, uh, to Kafka. Um, say you're producing messages about the state of your employer records, or you're producing messages about uh, um, the order uh, orders that someone made uh, in your e-commerce application, or you are, you know, um, producing records that have some medical information or whatever. So this the topic is means of categorizing the data, but it's a bit more than that, and a side note here, when I'm saying records and messages, it's basically the same thing through the course of this um, of this uh, presentation and demo. I will try to um, explicitly tell you when it's not, but mostly when you see or hear records, it's messages, the same thing. Now, the topic is implemented in a form of log files. And they live in a file system of a brokers. Remember, I said that broker has the data. That's how it has it. In a file system of a broker, you you will find files um, that actually have the data that was produced to the uh, to the particular topic or topics. Now, topic can contain one or more partitions, and it can have from zero to multiple producers and consumers. What that means is you could have a topic, and you can produce to that topic. Uh, and then stop producing forever, and you can still create multiple consumers and read from it. You can just produce to a topic and not consume. Uh, you can have multiple consumer groups from, for the same topic. It just doesn't care, okay? Now, the partition here is an interesting concept as well. So the partition is a part of a topic that physically lives on one of the brokers. Remember, we had a diagram where we had like three brokers. So if I have a topic with, uh, um, with the uh, with with the configured amount of partitions three, right? What will happen is you'll have a single partition of that topic on each of the brokers. That's at least right, but there is another con con configuration in Kafka uh, that is, that has a lot to to do with uh, uh, with resiliency and specifically the fact that you are capable of recovering and you uh, you are capable of failing over. In case of one of the, in case of failure of one of the of the brokers, which is, um, it is a uh, replication factor basically, right? So that replication factor tells you that if you have a partition on a broker, it has to be replicated to at least these many brokers as well, right? This gives you a guarantee if configured correctly, and if with the default configuration as well, it gives you a guarantee that. If you have produced to a topic and that message hit one of the partitions of a topic, then with the default configuration, if I'm not mistaken, um, what like getting back a response from Kafka's producer API that everything is good means that this message was not only placed into a partition of a specific broker, but it was also replicated to, to as many brokers as the replication configuration tells it should be. So if you, got a, if you got a successful response from Kafka, this means that now your message is stored in Kafka topic and it's stored in a very durable manner so that even if one of the brokers fails, you still have a backup to look at. And looking at that backup will happen automatically without you being involved into that. Now, 
the partitions are being assigned to consumers. And that happens as a part of a regular communication between a consumer and a Kafka cluster. Um, you don't have to worry about that too much if you are using Kafka's SDK for .NET. Um, but you have to keep in mind that, that um, the um, relationship there is um, one, part, one consumer can have many partitions assigned to it at the same time. However, never the same partition is assigned to different consumers within the same consumer group. So let's consider an example. Let's say I have a topic as on the picture with three partitions, right? If I have one consumer in the consumer group, it will get all three partitions assigned. Now, if I add another consumer to this group, one of the partitions will be reassigned from the first consumer to the second one or maybe two of them. But the point is, um, they won't be like, let's take a specific example. Partition zero would be reassigned to uh, my new consumer. This means that first consumer won't be getting data from this partition anymore. Now, what if I have three consumers? Kafka will do the rebalancing and it will try its best to assign the partitions evenly so that your new consumer will get one, one partition, your uh, two others will get one partition each, uh, each as well, right? What if I add fourth one, fourth consumer to the, to the consumer group? Well, nothing will be assigned to it. And that's important consideration for you when you're thinking about how do you configure your topics and partitioning strategy, because this explicitly affects the degree of horizontal scaling that you can provide for your consumers right so if you have uh you know high income of the of the messages um to a kafka topic and you have your service layer objective saying that your consumers should be consuming almost real time then you should consider probably a higher level of partitions and uh um th that would give you an ability to you know to scale horizontally significantly and um, if you have spike workloads the same thing right consider having a lot of partitions uh, that will help you to scale horizontally as needed. Um, and one more important thing that I didn't mention is in our example, when we had three consumers and three partitions, right? What will happen if one of my consumers dies or just, you know, I'm scaling down. What will happen is say it had partition zero assigned to it. This partition will get reassigned during Kafka's rebalancing routine to one of the live consumers. That's why Kafka is actually asking your consumers like, hey, are you okay there? Are you alive? And like by asking, it's not like you have to expose an, AV, an API for it. Um, so you don't really have to do anything for it. Now, that's um, a little bit about topics and partitions. What I didn't explain yet is the offset. So the offset is an integer value that you can see here on the picture, right? And that value is indicating position of the record within the partition. That's important, not within the topic, but within the partition. And it's unique per partition and it's monotonically increasing. So you will never see the order of these, um, uh, of these offsets like zero, one, three, then six, then four. That won't happen ever. You can see gaps, but it's always monotonically increasing. So you can have like zero, one, three, six, 200 something that is possible in some cases but again this is a bit more advanced topic that we can discuss at the end of this presentation um, so that also gives you an important thing to think through right if ordering um, is within the partition not within the topic then uh, having more than one consumer and more than one partition means that i can consume messages in a different order right then they were produced so this is an interesting consideration to think of and we can discuss this moving forward so far i'd like to ask you if there are any questions to these two slides before i move on anyone that's scary that means that either nothing is clear or everything 
I will be optimistic and assume that it was clear enough, <laughs> right? So let's move on. Final slide of our exercise, Kafka in three slides, right? Um, we talked about brokers, zookeepers. We talked about the high level architecture of Kafka. We talked about what the topics and partitions are and offsets, right? That's all nice. Uh, but what is not really clear is, okay, we talked about a primitive, which is a record or a message, if you will. We didn't mention what that is, right? So in Kafka, this record is comprised of a key and a value. A key is defined by a producer and it affects partitioning and compaction. It can be null. I, um, I will try to explain how a key affects this partitioning and compaction just in a moment. Now, a value, well, that's what you want to send with your message. That's the message itself, right? It's body of it, if you want to think of it in, you know, in terms of HTTP requests, for example. But keep in mind a special case. A null value and not null key is treated as a tombstone event for a compacted topics. I'll explain this in a moment too. Now, all the records are transmitted in a binary format between producers and Kafka and then Kafka and consumers. So this means that you want to be capable of serializing and serializing um, unless you are you know, exchanging primitive types like strings or integers. Um, so you will have to build your own for your own models at some point. Um, and then the same thing for deserialization. There are a few tricks on how you can standard, standardize this for a larger company, um, but this is a bit out, outside of the, of the topic of this conversation. So again, records transmitted as binary. This means that you have to serialize and serialize the data just as with, uh, you know, as with JSON, for example, when you're talking uh, REST APIs or whatever else. Um, all right. Now, I'm, I promised that I'll explain what the key is and how it affects the partitioning and compaction. So by default, unless you override this behavior, um, if there is no key, Kafka will randomly distribute the uh, produced messages across uh, all the partitions that are within the topic, right? Obviously, if there is one partition, you'll get all of that in, in uh, all of the produced messages in the same topic and the same partition. However, if there is a key, then what will happen by default, uh, Kafka will take a key and will get a hash of it, right? And based on that hash, it will send it to a particular partition that it will, it will pick on, on its own. Um, you can influence how that happens if you need to, if you really need to. But point is, um, this is important because if you produce another message with the same key, the key doesn't have to be unique, right? So if you produce another message with the same key, what Kafka guarantees you with this approach is that it will send this other message to exactly the same partition as the first one. So this is very important in terms of ordering because if you want to get at least some ordering guarantees, you want to make sure that your consumer consumes events from a particular partition and everything from that partition is exactly in the same order as it was produced to Kafka. Okay, now value, right? What, what was the special case there? Um, if you're, oh, actually I forgot about compaction. A compaction is a uh, special case of a, of a retention policy. Um, so I'll try to give you a brief description of the retention policies as well. Think of this, if we are producing messages to Kafka, right? And let's say we have tons of them. What, what are the options for data persistence, right? Kafka isn't, is not working as, you know, as uh, say Rabbit or other queues. If when you get the data from Kafka topic, it doesn't disappear. All the other consumers can still read the same thing, right? So we are producing data to a topic and it's stored in a file system of a brokers for, you know, forever. Should it be there forever? That brings a lot of problems like, okay, if it's there forever, then um, what if I have to comply with uh, GDPR or uh, regulations by United States authorities that um, 
might end up with someone telling you to delete the data. If your retention policy in Kafka is forever, right, you won't be able to do so. Now, this still might be a good choice for some cases, specifically for uh, the case when you want to have, like when you want to build an event sourcing system and you want to achieve the, uh, you, you want to build your journal of events on top of Kafka, right? So one, one quite smart, smart person that I worked with uh, said that you can think of Kafka with, you know, with no, res no retention policy on a topic as of a journal of events. If there is a retention policy defined as a delete, which is a default one, which means that like there are two key properties for Kafka configuration there. The, the policy is delete by default and the, the time window is seven days, right? So what will happen in this case is um, Kafka will drop records that are older than seven days from your topic, right? So if in case you are using this policy uh, for attention, then you actually have a stream of data, right? Uh, you're not trying to persist it there forever. And in most cases, this is more than enough. You don't need to persist data forever in majority of the cases. Uh, the third one is a compaction. So the compaction is, um, again, the same person um, once said that if you are using a topic with a compaction, it's basically a database. So um, the compaction works in the following way. When you are producing messages with the same key, once the compaction kicks in, it will take, it, it guarantees you that there is at least one record in the topic with uh, per unique key, basically. So if you have two messages with the same key, the one of them, which is which was produced the last, is guaranteed to be in the in the topic, and maybe some after it, like you can get um, more than one per key after the compaction. This also depends on the configuration, but at least one will be there per key. So why is it close to a database? Because this way you can guarantee that you have at least current state, right? So that's the compaction for you, the retention policy. Uh, sorry, yeah, the retention policy. But um, why is it a special case, right? Because when you are providing a key for a message for a record, but you are not providing a value, you're saying it's null, Kafka treats that for a topic with compaction as a tombstone event. And it typically is used for deleting the data from a compacted topic. That's the partitioning. Um, that, let, let me rephrase this. So that's basically all I want to show you on Kafka's basics. There is way more than that, but this is sufficient for us to give it a try, okay? Before we move on, I'd like to emphasize another thing, which is what are the guarantees? So the guarantees are the following. Um, there, and like there is much more than these depending on the different configurations, but these are default configs. And these are um, guarantees that you are most likely to rely on, right? At least at the beginning. So by default, it's at least once delivery. So what that means is, uh, once your producer have produced a message, uh, right, then your consumer will get this message at least once. This means that um, your consumers should be item potent, right? So that if you consume the same consume the same message again, uh, that it doesn't lead to a different state than you had after the first uh, first message. Uh, identical message was consumed. Now, the second guarantee is consumer of a given topic partition will always read the records in exactly the same order that they were written to the, to the partition. Again, important thing here, it's a topic partition, not a topic. Ordering is guaranteed per partition. Um, next one is by default, when a key is defined for a record, the record with the same key will end up in the same partition. We talked about that, remember? That is important because of the way 
the partitions are assigned to the to the consumers and that helps you to organize ordering and organize consumption so that uh, you can ensure that out of order processing doesn't happen or if it happens it's a very rare case finally the strong durability remember the replication thing we talked about right that in case of a failover, uh, when one of the brokers is down for some reason, you should like you you can um, fill over to a different broker and use a replica of your partition right there. Okay, those are basic guarantees that are probably most important ones for getting started. Any questions so far? None. Okay. So let's get back to our problem. What does it have to do with the problem? Why, why do we talk Kafka throughout the course of this uh, session? So Kafka decouples producers and consumers. So you're getting the loose coupling that we wanted, right? But how do we get the data from SQL Server to Kafka? Um, on January 1st, 2020, Gunnar Morling, a uh, lead engineer on the Divisium project, did a talk on a QCon conference where he discussed the change data capture technique which we are going to use by leveraging SQL Server data capture and Divisium connector for the SQL Server, right? And doing so, we will implement a pattern uh, that is known as a transactional log tailing. So let's take a look at how does that work. If you take a look at the right side of the slide, um, you'll see the screenshot taken from official docs of the SQL Server. Say you have a relational database, your SQL Server database that we talked about, but you have your source tables. That's what you are used to work with, right? But those are actually, you can think of them as views of a transactional log of the database. The actual uh, data about what happened and what was committed is in the log. So the change data capture in SQL Server is a separate process, which is a job on the SQL Server that tails this log and it reads it based on the data it read from the log. It writes uh, every single change to every single row that uh, in, a, in a table for which you enable this process. And it writes this to, the, to a separate change table in a different schema. I will show that on practice in a moment. Now, SQL Server also provides a change data capture query functions that will allow you to get, the reliably, get, the, get these records reliably. Now, think of it. If this is happening, then I am not causing any locks, any blocking on the source tables right here, right? So whatever the processes are that are working with those tables now won't be affected. Sure, I will have to find some dedicated resources for this capture process and I need space for these change tables, but this is not affected, right? So this allows me to keep everything that is currently working on these tables intact, no changes there whatsoever, right? We, uh, plenty of times when people are discussing um, approaches to how to you know, cut the, something from the monolith and move to microservices, right? They are saying, uh, or, or to move to event-driven architecture, they are saying, hey, you have to strangle all the writers. Um, sometimes it's just not feasible because you might have like plenty of them and you can't just, strangle them all in one day and say, hey, there is just one writer to, to those tables. Sometimes that's just not happening in a short period of time. So with this approach, you don't have to, like you don't care who's writing to those tables, who's reading from them. The fact is you are getting all the changes that are happening to the source tables right here in a form of, in a queryable form. So this is your log tailing, right? Now, the talk that Gunnar did um, discussed the following system where you had a, a, a service of sorts or an application on top of a relational database, right? And he also mentioned Kafka Connect. This is one of the tools in the Kafka's belt. And uh, what that is, you can think of it as a server that just runs jobs, right? It's used for um, usually for the uh, migration purposes of, or synchronization purposes where you would take the data from specific source and put it to Kafka topic. Now, 
the source could be almost anything. There are tons of different ready-made connectors that you could use. It could be Postgres, it could be not even relational database at all. It could be a file system, right? Whatever. Point is, it's a separate component in your system where the connector lives, which describes how to get the data from the source and put it to a Kafka topic. So that's what we are going to try, right? With our specific example, right? We will get this ready and we will have something that simulates this part and we will get data to the Kafka topic. Um, so moving on, any questions before we move on to practice? None, actually looking at the time now, I think I took too much time on discussing the theory. I'm hoping you all have a few minutes to uh, bear with me and we could take a look at the practical part. All right, so here's the practical part. Um, actually, let me find my, uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, clear, okay. Uh, and I'll try to move this somewhere. Okay, um, so what, what I have here is basically a simulation of that system uh, written with .NET and some um, tooling that I used mostly to play around with it. What first of these tools is uh, Project Thai. So this Thai YAML that you can see right here is um, basically, you can think of it as a, an, another Docker Compose. All right. So if you are familiar with Docker Compose, this will be very simple for you. Now, point is, uh, Project Thai is an experimental tool uh, built by Microsoft Devs, and um, um, its its goals, at least as of now, is to simplify contain containerization and deployment for .NET Devs. Right. What this does is, you know, I don't have to like if I have a project that I want to containerize and then uh, run it as a container. Um, and maybe deploy to Kubernetes, I don't have to build any um, Docker files, build images, define manifests. Um, all I need is a, is a project tie to use there. Uh, but again, this is very, um, like th this, this is not production ready tool. It's, a, it's an experimental stage. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with Docker Compose, this will be um, easy for you as Pi, right? So here's what I have there in services. I do have an inventory API. This is a C-sharp project. It's a simple console application that exposes in a gRPC API. Um, it exposes it using port uh, 552, and uh, it uses an HTTP protocol because gRPC works on top of it. Now, I am using two replicas, so it will be load balanced. Now, um, there is another console application, which is a data gen. It's basically a gRPC client for this application, right? Um, it will simply talk to this API and it will try to generate stuff for us, right? Um, so that is, um, that is what, um, uh, what I have here in terms of applications, right? But what's, what's with the database? Here's the monolithic database here. Um, so this, was, this application was built as if it simulates, you know, a, a, uh, um, a monolith with a, with a single database, right? So don't, don't judge me too hard. <laughs> so this monolithic database is used for uh, storing the data, right? So we are trying to simulate this part where you have something already existing, where you have a database and you have something writing to the database and uh, you don't want to touch that, right? So that's what we are trying to simulate. And this configurator is uh, intended for configuration of uh, of our database um, and other other tools that we're going to use a bit later. So I am using official Microsoft uh, um, image for SQL Server and inside of this API and a data gen, what I have is I mentioned gRPC a little bit. If you haven't worked with it, I uh, encourage you to give it a try. It's a great tool um, for building an APIs and communicating your contracts. And it's actually faster than usual HTTP communication. Um, for RESTful APIs, uh, specifically because it talks binary over the wire. But point is, I am describing the contract for my service as this. It's basically, you can think of it as an interface, as a C-sharp dev, right? So here is a bunch of methods that you have declared in, in your interface. That's, that's your service definition. It's, uh, it's a simple proto file. It uses a protobuf for, GRPC uses protobuf for, um, 
describing the contracts and uh, using the uh, this, the RFC for it for serialization. So this tells you the interface of the service, right? So my service can add engines, update engines, list engines, and remove engines, and the same thing with vehicles. So I have two entities in my system. There's engines and there's vehicles. All right, that's that was simple enough, but what are these, right? So these are um, engines and vehicles right here, right? I do have a collection of engines in one message, and I do have an engine itself, which is comprised of a UID, vehicle UID, year of manufacture, manufacturers, and some additional properties right here. Fairly simple, pretty much the same thing as you do with the C-sharp. You define uh, your models, you define your interface, and uh, you can do the name spacing and other things uh, on top of the gRPC. It's quite powerful, powerful. It allows a lot of extensibility and it also is uh, helpful in terms of uh, dictating the backward compatibility or breaking changes to existing, um, to existing contracts. So I encourage you to look into protobuf and into gRPC. Um, if you have any questions, just being me, I'll do my best to help you out with that. Um, but other than this, I would also like to encourage you to look at one of the .NET uh, uh, community talks that uh, I think was made by Roman Lemko approximately a year ago. Um, it's quite interesting thing to look at. Um, and it talks at length about, um, uh, he talks at length about GRPC and Protobuf. All right, so this is my contract. Now, from I think .NET Core 3.1, um, uh, our projects in like both Writer or Visual Studio have a, have a way to take these proto files and generate code based on this. So these files with the inv like inventory.cs and value, um, value objects.cs are auto generated. I didn't write any of them. And this is something that you get almost for free, right? All you have to do is to go to your uh, project files. Um, and there you, you will have to supply the target um, for cleaning the proto buff. And uh, you'll have to include your uh, proto stuff here. Um, and finally, you'll have to import some NuGets, which are specifically gRPC tools and its dependencies. That's all you have to do. Um, you can actually even make this a bit more um, fancy and clearer than that. Now, this is uh, a contract that I do have, you know, as a, all I wrote was these proto files in this proto folder. And now I'm sharing it between my API and my uh, data gen right here. So um, that gives me a way to expose uh, an API through here. And the way I do this is by implement by inheriting from inventory service base, this is auto generated, and simply overriding the methods that I have defined in my contract in Protobuf, right? So, basically, all this does it, it works as a um, as a you know, as a simple data service, right? It just takes the data, maps it to something, and puts it to the to the SQL Server database. That's basically it. Um, now, this is implementation of your API. Now the data gen is a bit more dirty than that, um, but it uses a client. So I have everything in one file here, best practice for demos. Um, so what, what we have here is um, we have a few configuration values that we've took like, hey, how many vehicles do I have to create? Um, and what's the addresses? And how do I communicate to the API and so on? Um, and uh, all we actually do is uh, we randomly update a vehicle all the time, right? And with this random update of the vehicle, what I'm doing is I'm picking a vehicle and I'm just changing values for the vehicle itself through a client. So this client is also auto-generated stuff by the protobuf and uh, uh, gRPC tools. Um, and uh, that's basically it, this inventor's inventory service client. And yeah, you should be disposing it, which I think I'm not doing here. Anyways, um, point is I am going to write stuff to the console once I'm updating vehicles and engines, right? That's basically it. So I'm just generating stuff and writing it to an API. Now, with regard to Project I, a fancy thing here is um, that .NET has support for it in terms of you can use this get service URI um, 
uh, extension method on the configs, um, uh, in, on the configuration that will help you to get generated URI by, pro by project tie uh, and explain you how to talk to your API, right? So whereas in, uh, uh, you know, in, in um, um, Docker Compose, you'd have to play around with uh, environment variables and stuff. This is, uh, this, is, this, um, this is something that project tie does for you a little bit better. All right, um, so with all that in mind, let's just give it a try and see what will happen. While I'm running this, um, any questions from anyone? None, and I'm pleasantly surprised that we still have a lot of people on the call, even though I'm way over time. <laughs> Okay, so tons of logs from Ty, right? But one of the most interesting log records is this. This is a dashboard that Project Ty gives us. So I am going to open it up. Okay, so here we have all our services, right? We have two projects, we have a container with the database and we have a container with the configuration, right? We have amount of replicas, bindings that tells you, hey, behind this URL, there is an API, right? And uh, uh, bindings for the database as well. Um, and uh, we can take a look at the logs. So pretty much the same thing you're getting with uh, Docker, for example, and Docker actually looks a bit more interesting, but let's take a look at this tool since we picked it to play around. So here's our inventory API. We do have a lot of exceptions here, right? Why is that so? And uh, why at the end of it, I still can do 200s. So thing is, unlike Docker Compose, there is no way for Ty to supply a weight. Like you have to build your applications and your containers in a resilient manner. Uh, it forces you to do so. Um, so if like reason why we got these exceptions is my database wasn't ready once I started the whole thing, right? And so I tried to connect to it. I couldn't, I couldn't execute the, uh, the request. So reason why um, I think why, Ty, why devs for Ty made this uh, decision of you know, not supplying weights I think it's a very good one because like we usually forget about making our applications resilient. This thing forces you to. It literally forces you to make sure that if there is a failure which is transient, which can go away within a few minutes or, or seconds, doesn't matter, you should be retrying, you should be handling it well. This also helps in terms of you know making your services loosely coupled and resilient. Now we saw we saw the 200s, right? The, which means that we supplied some uh, some responses. So set, let's take a look at what happens here. And we got some reports about uh, errors. We have a uh, policy which was implemented using Poly, um, which uh, great NuGet. Uh, so who didn't work with it? Take a look at it. It's a resiliency policy library that has tons of um, patterns implemented, including retry, circuit breakers, read through cache, um, bulk has, and lots, lots of others. So this is our resiliency policy for the data gen. And then we got some responses. We actually updated some data. We sent some of the data to, uh, to the API. Um, let's take a look at uh, how our database is faring. So let me get my SQL Management Studio up and running, which I should have done way before this meeting started. Uh, while it is starting, um, any questions so far? None. Okay. So um, here is my database. Um, and I do have some tables inside of it, which is engines and vehicles. So let me do um, use, whoops, use inventory. Um, and now let's do um, select all from engines. 
I do have a data. That's already nice. OK, so we have simulated something. All right, let's stop the tie and let's make another step forward, uh, which would be uh, get checkout step two. OK, let's add the change data capture. Now, the way to do this, um, you can find in the scripts folder here. It's um, uh, I will share the link to um, to this repository a bit later. Uh, but point is this: this is a part of the configurator container that we were using, and it starts from the, the from this shell script, and it also has to be resilient because of the tie, right? So you'll have you, you will find this um, um, retry basically uh, in a script <laughs> implemented in a scripting way. But point is what this is doing is. It goes to this to the uh, SQL Server and uh, it's running the migration. It creates the tables, right? And then I am using this setup SQL uh, for running the migration. And then once that is done, I'm running the enable CDC shell. Um, that's the thing here. What it does is it goes to the server. Um, and it makes sure that some of the prerequisites are met, which is the current server name and expected server name is correct. Um, that's a bug that uh, I believe Microsoft did when they published the public image. It has to be fixed up, but in your production environments, it's likely already fixed up. Now, another thing is we have to allow a snapshot isolation on the, on the SQL Server database. And uh, finally, what this, does is it goes through the um, environment variable called CDC enabled. Um, and sorry, it actually checks if CDC is enabled. And if it doesn't, it calls a, a, a sprog that enables the uh, change data capture on that database. And then it goes to the CDC tables environment variable, tracks all the tables. And for each table, what it will do, it will check if there is a change tracking table for it. And if, it not, if it's not there, it will call this procedure that will in turn create, that will in turn um, turn on the change data capture process for that particular table. So the granularity of the CDC in SQL Server is table-based. You can enable it for two tables, but not for the rest of the database, okay? Now, this gives you, um, this allows you to, you know, to enable change to data capture in a resilient manner as well. Let's take a look at how does that work. So let's run uh, tie again. Okay, I want to see first two hundreds here. Okay, I've got some, good. I've got some 200, so I should have some data here already. Let's execute the thing, not yet. Oh, here it is, perfect. So that's the uh, content of our table, right? But now I want to see what's the change tracking is. So I'm going to do this. See the convention here, it's schema, it's table name, and then un underscore CT and the schema in the database is CDC. That's where your change tracking data lives. You can do a simple select, but it's better to use uh, uh, functions that SQL Server listed on their official docs. Here's how the record looks like. It's start positioning the log. Um, actually, let me rephrase this. Is a position in the log, right? Um, sometimes you'll get another one for some of the edge cases. Um, it's also a sequence value that helps in some cases when there is a change to a column that lives in uh, that, that is a part of an index. There is update mask and there is an operation key. So this operation key helps you to track down if it's an update, insert, or delete, right? Um, and uh, there is also the state of the record. Okay, so this is insert if I recall correctly. Uh, three is before update, four is after update. So see, I have a record state before update and I have a record state after update. 
this is great because now I can tell you both states and if I put that to an event, it's very powerful. All right, um, that helps us to track down the changes. Now, I don't want to you know, build some custom stuff that will help me to translate that into meaningful data. That's where Debezium comes in. Let me tear this down and let's get more infrastructure in place. So let's do git checkout uh, step, I think three, if I recall correctly, and see what I have in Thai YAML. This time we're not going to run Thai, but what we have here is I added Kafka infrastructure, right? So here is Kafka Zookeeper. I used uh, Confluent um, images for a zookeeper for one broker and for the other, you can use another image which is all in one. Um, and um, that there is also a set of environment variables that are described quite well in um, uh, Confluence docs and Kafka's docs. Um, that will it will help you to configure Kafka for your local development. Um, and what else? So I have Kafka Brokers, um, I have Kafka Zookeeper. You can do all of that using Docker uh, Compose. That will work perfectly fine. And um, I do have a Confluent Control Center. That's for, that's basically a UI that I'm going to use to show you what's in the topics. And my configurator scripts changed a little bit. So if you take a look at this, uh, actually it will change a little bit. So let me get back to this and uh, say I want to do git checkout step uh, four. This adds Kafka Connect, more infrastructure. So um, if we take a look at the Thai YAML here, you will see that I have added another service, which is Kafka Connect. Again, this time I'm using Debezium's official image, a bunch of config variables here that will allow me to integrate this guy with Kafka brokers, with the zookeeper, right? And a uh, configuration values that um, I'm, that we supplied will help us to integrate that all of that together. But I'm also going to create a connector. So there is a connector shell script right here. What this does, it uses an API, like we do a curl to an API of the Kafka Connect, and uh, uh, we simply supply a set of configurations, right? So in this configuration, we are saying I want to you to use a SQL Server connector. That is basically implementation of a connector by Debezium. Here is where the database lives and how to get to it. Here is a list of tables. See, I am using here environment variable. So this is reusable basically for your, for your own sandboxes or proof of concepts. So here is the table include list. Now, this is something that Debezium requires to give you the guarantee of no message loss and proper, uh, pre proper supplying of the messages. Um, and um, yeah, rest of it is something that you don't have to worry too much about. It just tells you how to query the data and how to uh, send stuff to, uh, to Kafka topic. Um, and uh, basically it affects a little bit of, of a performance. You would be fine with these values for your own proof of concepts. All right, so this configures the connector. Now I want to, uh, you know, to see if it works. Um, but before that, let me see if I didn't forget anything. Check out step five. Um, all right, util okay, step five, I don't care about that too much. Um, so let's do git check out step four again. And whoops. Um, and this time let's do Tyran. And let's switch to this again. Now I do have more services here, right? There is Kafka Connect, there is Control Center, which I'm going to open here. Um, let's see if my configurator worked well. Okay, there is a bunch of variables here and it didn't finish yet. Okay, network connection is not yet ready. Okay, migration is done, CDC enabled, and we are good with that. 
let's see if my database is okay. We are good. Okay, so now if we go to this control center, refresh it, we do have one Kafka cluster here, right? Here it is. We do have a list of topics. There is 44, but we actually care about those that we have created and they will be named by default as a server name schema table, right? So there is one topic per table that we are tracking. And uh, let's see what the messages are. So if I put here, I want to see everything from the zero, per, the zero offset in the partition zero, I can find here already my messages. So we actually have data in Kafka, okay? You can see what, what the content of it is. There is quite a lot, but it's when you consume it, it's basically a JSON, right? So you can get the data from that JSON and uh, um, you, from this JSON, you will be able to find um, the details about the previous state and uh, the final state, right? So you can see this value payload after, and there is also value payload before. And it has every single property from every single row that was changed. So we managed to get data from the SQL server to Kafka, right? I think that's already a lot. Now we need to somehow consume the thing, right? That will be the last thing that I'm going to demo for you today. Um, so I'm going to shut this down and do get checkout uh, step seven. And here's what I have in addition to what we've saw so far. I'm going to show this a bit more in more details in our part two session, which I'm hoping will happen next week. Um, and I would really appreciate if you could join that too. Hope, I'm hoping that this, can, this uh, demo was interesting for you. So I'm, going, I'm hoping to see you there. But um, here's what I have in addition. In addition to that infrastructure, I do have a uh, aggregator um, console application here. That's basically my consumer. It will consume from these topics that I have produced too. And uh, um, I also have a Postgres database that here's the project that writes to this Postgres, da Postgres database. Now there is a uh, Kafka project that right here, you'll have some specific stuff for, um, for Kafka, right? And this Divisium message handler is exactly the thing that works with the consumer result. This consumer result is a part of Kafka's SDK for .NET. That's the message you are consuming. Now, how do you consume it? That will be mostly in the next session, but you can find this in this Kafka background worker. It's a generic worker uh, that forces you to define a key and a value. It's my implementation. You can use your own that is not generic and doesn't really care what's inside of it. But point is this worker will do a very simple thing. It will, con will configure a consumer, this iConsumer, it's implementation of a Confluence contract that is actually available in Confluence uh, SDK for .NET for Kafka. And uh, I'm just going to subscribe to a topic list from the configuration. And in an endless while loop, I'm just going to consume forever, right? I'm just consuming all the time. And, if my, and, and then once I've consumed the message, I'm going to pass it on to handling logic. If I had no um, errors during, during processing, I will just commit an offset. That tells Kafka that next time I'm asking you for another message, just give me a next one in the partition. <coughs> Sorry, all right. So this is a spoiler of um, what we will talk during the next session. As for the uh, demo of itself, I'm going to do a tie run and explain to you what will happen uh, once it's ready. So we added a consumer to the picture, right? We are using Confluence SDK. We are processing these messages somehow. Um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consume these messages and I'm going to put them to a uh, database, to a different database, which is Postgres, right? And in this Postgres database, I do have um, the, um, not that, I do have just two tables for now, 
it's uh, inbound events. So basically, I'm just saving the payloads I have consumed, right? I'm not doing any transformations. I'm just saving them. And um, I'm going to put there some unit on the on every payload, and I'm going to store an offset, the source, the event key, and the event message as a blob. So that's all what I'm doing for the consumption so far. The next session, I'm going to show you how you can transform this data and how you can act upon it, uh, and how you can re-aggregate the data, um, and how you can publish it further to different topics using different transactional messaging patterns, which is transactional outbox, um, and uh, using and, and the other one is the polling publisher. So those would be two important uh, patterns that I wanted to want to show you next time. Um, for now, however, let's take a look at what's happening in my control center. And uh, yeah, I want to see this. I do have my topics. That's good. Let's see if I have messages already. Um, I want to see something from the partition zero. I do have messages. That's good. Um, so let's take a look at um, Postgres. So I'm going to use a PG admin tool which is currently starting. Hold on a second. OK, so here is my database. And I'm going to query. I'm going to do select all from CDC inbound event. So here is the JSON payload that um, you can that we have consumed from Debezium's connector. You can look through it as well, or you can use Control Center for it. And you can see the details about what the operation was, what's the payload after, and if it were there, what's the payload before, right? That's it for the demo today. And so getting back to our presentation, I'd like to ask if you have any questions um, 